Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. A few days ago, you might have seen our overclocking examination of the GeForce RTX 2080 Ti. Well, today we're going to be discussing the RTX 2080. We'll be covering everything from how to overclock these cards, a look at the NVIDIA scanner, typical achievable clock speeds, and performance. If you've overclocked a GPU before, a lot of the things we go through in the guide section of this video will be pretty familiar to you, though depending on what GPU you last overclocked, there might be a few new interesting things to note. And of course, if you're more interested in things Things like final overclock performance and clock speeds, you can just skip over the instructional section. Also, if you watched our 2080 Ti video on overclocking, expect to see most of the guide section essentially rehashed as it's all very similar. To start off this video, I'll be going through our standard methodology for overclocking NVIDIA graphics cards. The card we're using today is the Founders Edition RTX 2080, which does come factory overclocked compared to base level board partner models, but the OC is quite small, just 90 megahertz on the core and nothing on the memory. But the card we're using doesn't really matter. The steps you see here will apply to all RTX 2080 cards. So the first thing we'll be doing is going through potentially the easiest method of overclocking your RTX 2080, and that's using NVIDIA's new scanner API. One-click overclocking has been around for a while, but this time NVIDIA has built a framework for doing it rather than letting board partners create their own algorithms. And according to NVIDIA, their framework is better tuned for their GPUs, more accurate and more reliable than any previous one-click methods. As with the RTX 2080 Ti, we're using MSI Afterburner here as it was the more reliable of the tools we used. After you've installed and opened Afterburner, you'll see a bunch of dials and sliders, but what you want to click on is the small bar graph icon to the left of the core clock slider. At this stage, it's not necessary to touch anything else in the app. Simply click on the bar graph icon, then click OC Scanner, and then in that window, hit Scan. Now you can sit back and wait a while because the one-click overclock process takes around 15 to 20 minutes. What the scanner is doing is basically running a bunch of clock speed tests at a range of voltages to find the exact voltage frequency curve for your 2080 model. It has its own test algorithm built in to stress the GPU with the ability to recover from any hangs or crashes if the GPU is being pushed a bit too hard. It's basically simulating what we'd do with a manual overclock, but doing it faster and potentially more accurately. Don't worry if the application hangs or goes black temporarily during the process, that's normal. At the end, you'll be given an average overclock, but crucially, you'll get a full frequency curve, which potentially is a bit more efficient than a simple core frequency offset. You can see at the lower end of the voltage curve, we're getting slightly higher overclocks than at the top. On average, we achieved plus 113 megahertz but at the top end, our OC is just plus 90 megahertz or so. At this point, we'd recommend heading back into the Afterburner main application and cranking up the power and temperature limits to the maximum. We've never benchmarked a card, even a last generation Pascal card, that didn't like having these limits raised all the way. So with the 2080, it just makes sense to crank it up. This will allow NVIDIA's GPU boost algorithm to push as high as possible on top of the frequency curve we've already set, often going beyond the old limit. One thing to note here is we have set the power and temperature limit after running NVIDIA scanner. NVIDIA says the scanner only modifies the core clock, so if you change the power and temperature limits beforehand, the scanner might find different and potentially higher core clocks. However, in our experience, we actually achieved lower clocks in the scanner setting the power limit beforehand, so I'd recommend cranking it up after the scanner is complete. The other obvious limitation is the lack of memory clock gains. NVIDIA Scanner only handles the GPU core and doesn't touch memory. So if you're after that simple one-click overclock solution, you'll be missing out on any gains you'd get from tweaking memory. Core overclocking is much more important for getting performance gains, but a boost to memory can help out in some situations. So we've got the Scanner OC results now in the bag. Let's show you how to perform a manual overclock, and after that, we'll compare the manual overclock to the scanner results. For this, we're switching to EVGA Precision X1 because it has a much nicer and more intuitive interface. For a manual overclock, we want to start from a decent point, so again we're going to crank the power limit and temperature limit to the maximum. We're also going to scroll to the bottom section across to the temp tuner and adjust the curve so we're getting the maximum clock speed at all possible temperatures. From here, it's all about adjusting the two main sliders for memory and core frequency. The basic steps are we want to increase each value by a reasonable amount, apply the overclock, then validate it in a program like 3D Mark to ensure we're not getting crashes at those settings. The amount you increase the values is up to you, but note that you're not going to damage your card by choosing a value that's too high. Instead, you'll just crash your system and have to reset it, so not a really big deal. 
So for the 2080, we started with around a plus 100 megahertz offset on the core and plus 650 on the memory. Those are fairly conservative figures for this card. That worked in 3D Mark, so we pushed the core up to plus 130 and memory up to plus 700. If you want to play it more safe, we'd recommend only changing one of those values per test run. But again, the more you become familiar with the process, the more you can adjust at once. With plus 130 on the core, our 2080 crashed in 3D Mark, so it's now a process of finding the exact limit. We stepped down in 10 megahertz increments, eventually discovering that plus 120 was unstable, but plus 110 was perfectly fine. From here, we can try to push up the memory even further using a similar sort of process, but in the end, around plus 700 was right on the limit. So our final stable overclocks for this card were plus 110 megahertz on the core and plus 700 megahertz on the memory, and that's a fairly typical figure going on what we've seen from others. Note that if you have a non-FE or non-factory OC card, the core offset you'll need will be higher as you're coming from a lower starting point. Once you find what you think are stable overclocks, again, it's always a good idea to validate them further in a game running for several hours, something very GPU intensive. While 3 d Mark's Time Spy gives a good indication of whether a card will work at a certain frequency, sometimes it will only crash under a longer test, so it's better to test both. A quick note on voltage, NVIDIA's Turing cards are voltage locked, in other words NVIDIA does not expose proper voltage controls to the user, like you might get with overclocking a CPU on a motherboard. Instead we have a voltage slider, but it's not really an offset. What it theoretically does is raise the voltage limit by a few steps, but still within what NVIDIA deems safe. In practice though, raising the voltage slider did absolutely nothing for our overclock, so it's not even worth using. Our final results from manual overclocking did give us slightly higher clocks, around plus 110 MHz on the core compared to plus 90 MHz. We also overclocked the memory, which the OC scanner does not handle whatsoever, and that provides an additional performance boost. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, for example, the results from using just the scanner gave us a 4% performance improvement over the FE clocks, whereas our manual overclock boosted performance by 8%. However, one easy trick for those using the OC scanner might be to use a fairly conservative memory overclock for simplicity's sake, something like plus 600 megahertz. Going with that changes the results, makes the scanner plus memory overclock 7% faster than the FE clocks, but again, the full manual overclock provides a slightly better result. So now we've shown that our manual overclock is very slightly superior to the results with the OC scanner. Now let's take a look at a handful of games to see how that overclock compares to both stock and Founders Edition performance. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider running 4K with the maximum quality settings and SMAA T2X, we saw overclocking provide 11% more performance than the standard clocks for the 2080 and 8% more than the Founders Edition clocks. That's an okay result, not quite as good as the overclock results for the 2080 Ti, but the 2080 is clocked higher by default and both chips appear to have the same sort of clock speed cap. In Assassin's Creed Origins at 4K Ultra High preset, the margins are a little narrower, 10% performance increase over the default clocks and 7% over the Founders Edition. In Far Cry 5 we're looking at 11% over the default and 10% over the Founders Edition. In Middle Earth Shadow of War there was a 12% improvement over default and 11% over Founders Edition. And finally, in Batman Arkham Knight, 11% over default and 8% over Founders Edition. So from those five games, we achieved a performance improvement of 11% on average compared to stock clocks and 9% compared to the Founders Edition clocks. We're pretty much running into a power limit here. Looking at the design of the power delivery on the FE cards, there might be a bit more headroom available if NVIDIA properly unlocked voltage controls, but this is around as good as we're getting from what we can configure at the moment. In terms of temperatures and fan speeds, again, what Steve found in his initial review of the 2080 is spot on compared to what I achieved on my test bench. Core temperatures increased from 76 degrees Celsius under load with the Founders Edition clocks to 81 degrees Celsius when overclocked. That's a bit below the card's native 84C temperature limit and well below the increased 88C limit, so it's pretty clear that's not going to be a limiting factor for performance. Fan speeds as well, 2060 RPM with the FE clocks, 2180 RPM when overclocked using the default auto fan speed. So a slight increase there, but there's really no difference to the sound profile. The card is pretty quiet when overclocked. Also, of course, both the noise output and temperatures will be different with board partner models. And if you're wondering about power consumption, well, there wasn't a lot of difference in load power draw between the default and founders edition clocks, so that shouldn't be a huge surprise considering the FE clocks are only slightly faster. But when overclocked, power draw increases by around 13% on average compared to what the FE clocks draw. So a 13% increase in power consumption for 9% more performance. Again, that's a fairly typical result. If you're wondering about the actual clock speeds I achieved, I was averaging around 1770 megahertz in Shadow of the Tomb Raider with the stock clocks, 1865 megahertz with the FE clocks, and 1990 megahertz when overclocked with the peak around 2010 megahertz. 
One last thing you might be interested in are the clock speeds we achieve when the fan speeds are set to maximum, which could be an indication of how liquid cooling might benefit the 2080. However, results are a bit disappointing, dropping the card by only 20 degrees Celsius to around a tick over 60 degrees under load. I only gained around 50 megahertz to sustained clock speeds, which was a 2% performance increase over our standard overclock for multiple times the noise output, of course. Overall, that was a difference between 8% and 9.5% more performance over FE clocks, so not a whole lot for a massive temperature drop. So that just about wraps up this look into 2080 overclocking. With the cards we have on hand, there is some extra performance to squeeze out, but again, nothing too different from our 2080 Ti. In fact, I was able to reuse a bunch of stuff from that video, which is always nice. Makes our job creating this content a bit easier. Sorry if you saw some of those sections repeated if you've watched both videos. And again, the NVIDIA Scanner API seems to be quite okay, especially if you combine it with a conservative memory overclock. If you're interested in our ongoing NVIDIA RTX coverage, subscribe to get that content in your inbox and be sure to hit the bell icon too. Consider supporting us on Patreon to chat directly with us about RTX cards in our Discord chat or really anything else, and I'll catch you in the next one.